Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 125, The Rise and Rise of Hamburg. The last two episodes may have left you with a sense of gloom and foreboding about the great Hanseatic cities, but here is the counterintuitive fact. The Hanse may continuously lose political power and economic relevance, but the cities that make up the association are flourishing. Not all of them, but some. Hamburg and Danzig in particular. Why that is, that the Hansa declines, but the Hansards are doing mightily well, is what we're looking at this week. So, let's see. But, before we start, I would like to thank my patrons and those who have made a one-time contribution. It's not just the monetary generosity that I find so humbling, it's also how much you care about the podcast. So the other day, one of you, Michael B., an almost excessively generous patron, sent me a book I would have almost certainly overlooked. This book, J.K. Dunlop's History of Hamburg from 800 to 1952, was originally written for British officers stationed in Hamburg to help them familiarize themselves with the place they are now administrating. Now, First up, the book itself is a fascinating artifact of that period, but it's also charming and written in a crisp and concise almost military style I enjoy enormously. Quite a bit of it features in today's episode. So, thanks so much, Michael. And I would also like to thank Hayo G, Christy S, Timothy K H, and Brian C, who've kindly signed up on patreoncom history of the Germans. Last week we left the Hanseatic League, more precisely Lübeck, the city that had so often taken the lead in the political ambitions of this merchant association, defeated and humiliated. Its populist dictator Jürgen Wollenweber had dragged the city into the wars over the Danish succession following the deposition of King Christian II. In that war, Wollenweber had pursued an impossible objective, forcing the Danes to close the Öresund to all Dutch shipping, something no Danish king could ever grant. Without the Öresund tolls, a Danish ruler would have been too weak to control his powerful aristocrats, who for centuries had not only chosen their king, but also deposed a few of them. After the defeat, the reconstituted Patrician Council of Lübeck quickly made peace with the King of Denmark, the Protestant Christian III. That wasn't quite the end, though. Emperor Charles V had another go, supporting another candidate for the Danish throne. That conflict lasted into 1544 and ended with a peace treaty giving the Dutch completely free access to the Öresund. Lübeck did not get involved in that war at all. Lübeck made one last attempt at military dominance of the Baltic during the Nordic Seven Years' War, that's sometimes also called the War of the Three Crowns. That war was a bust-up between the successors of Christian III of Denmark and Gustav Vasa of Sweden. Though formally fought over the question whether the King of Denmark could carry three crowns on his coat of arms, behind it stood a set of much more tangible issues. Ivan IV, known to us as Ivan the Terrible, had, before he was consumed by paranoia and madness, pursued a successful expansion policy that gained him most of Livonia. The Teutonic Knights, who used to rule the territory, were reduced to just Kurland, and its last Landmeister, Gotthard Kettler, dissolved the ancient order of the Livonian sword brothers and became Duke of Kurland as a vassal of the King of Poland. Ivan the Not-Yet-Terrible sponsored Narva as its new main entrepot for the Russian goods, like furs and beeswax. Narva had not been allowed to join the Hanse thanks to the opposition of Rival, modern-day Tallinn. Narva became a great success and the Lübeck merchants travelled there instead of going to Tallinn where they had been subjected to protectionist rules for at least a century. Now, at the same time, Tallinn now saw protection from the Russians and Lübeck under the mighty arm of Sweden. So that when war broke out between Sweden and Denmark, Sweden seized 32 Lübeck ships. Lübeck had to respond. It declared war on Sweden and tried to gather support amongst the other Hansa cities. But again, nobody followed suit, in part because Lübeck had supported the city of Narva over its fellow Hansards at Tallinn. Seems you cannot call for Hanseatic solidarity when you fail to live it first. Lübeck found itself again as isolated as it had been under Wollenweaver. The city on the Trabe then doubled down. 
and it built the largest warship of its time, the Adler of Lübeck. 78 meters or 257 feet overall, 68 large cannons spread over three decks made it one of the earliest ships of the line. But it did not help. When the ship was commissioned in 1567, the naval war had already gone terribly badly for the city on the Trave. Its main fleet, including the flagship and the commanding Grand Admiral, had been lost in a storm off Gotland. So when the Adler was splashed, it could no longer be deployed successfully. So no shot was ever fired in anger. In 1570, the war was over. In the peace agreement, Lübeck got its trading privileges in Narva reconfirmed, but that turned out to be worth nothing. Because in the meantime, Ivan the Terrible had gone full-on mental, killing people on a near-industrial scale, which made it difficult for him to hold on to Livonia. Sweden conquered the province and took over Narva, at which point Lübeck merchants no longer held any special trading rights in commerce with what is slowly becoming Russia. That was also the last time Lübeck embarked on any kind of military adventure. Now, For the Hanse as a whole, the decline in the fortunes of Lübeck were a clear indication that the world had changed. They began to arrive at the correct analysis of why that was. Not the Dutch and English merchants were the problem, but the change in the political landscape. Other traders could count on the support of powerful states opening up trade routes and protecting their wares. The monarchs of England were sponsoring the merchant adventurers, who received patents to form the Muscovy Company, the Levant Company, and then most famously, the East India Company. The Dutch had the support of Charles V, and the Swedish, Danish, Norwegian and Russian rulers had shaken off the monopolistic powers of the Hanse. What the Hansa cities knew they needed was a powerful sponsor. The natural sponsor of what used to be the Hansa of the merchants of the Holy Roman Empire, well, that would have been the emperor himself, Charles V, and then later his brother Ferdinand I. But both of them were Catholics, which made them suspicious, and they were far away, which made them ineffective. Denmark, on the other hand, was close, and its ruler was a Protestant, but having fought a war too many against Copenhagen made that impossible. Danzig kept proposing the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, whose territory kept growing and growing. But that was a long shot for Cologne or Brunswick. So nothing came of this. Instead, the four lead cities, Cologne, Brunswick, Lübeck and Danzig, did the next best thing. They gave up their ancient tradition of being a loose federation and became a real organization. They initially agreed an alliance for only 10 years, but that was extended multiple times and lasted until the mid-end 17th century. The main tenets of the agreement were that each city would contribute towards a common budget that should fund the maintenance of the contours, joint provision of security for transports on land and at sea, dispensation of justice and, if needed, military retaliation against breaches of the peace. And for the first time, the Hanse was given its own bureaucracy. The role of the Council of Lübeck as General Secretary of the Hanse that called the Hanseatic Diets and set their agendas was given to a newly created Syndicus of the Hanse. Now, Syndicus is an ancient Latin word denominating someone tasked with defending the rights of an association or organization, but not necessarily leading it. So in modern German parlance, a Syndicus is the general council of a company. Now, most of the Hanseatic cities had a syndicus whose job it was to represent the city in negotiations with other cities or in court, whilst the major political decisions were taken by the city council and the burgomaster. So the role of the syndicus of the Hanse wasn't designed to create a CEO, but to be a go-to person for foreign powers who would like to discuss issues and that he could then propose to the Hanseatic Diet for resolution. The first syndicus of the Hanse was Heinrich Sudermann, a merchant from Cologne. An excellent choice. He had the social standing necessary as his family was one of the great families of Cologne, his father had been burgomaster for instance, and he had the necessary qualifications. He was a doctor of law from one of the great Italian universities and he had been on diplomatic missions for his hometown several times before. 
Sudermann stayed in post for an impressive 35 years, in the end was given the role for life. Still, his mega project turned out to be a disaster. He had seen the contours in Novgorod and Bergen going under, so Sudermann was intent on not letting that happen with the two remaining ones, in London and Bruges. And Bruges was the one that looked most at risk. Trade in the city had declined sharply since the end of the 14th century, so many of the foreigners who had made Bruges such an important centre of trade had moved on, mostly to nearby Antwerp. And that also included the Hanse merchants. Even though the merchants had left Bruges, the Hanse organisation kept insisting on the continued existence of the contour in Bruges. The reason was that in Bruges the Hanse had received, and was able to maintain, a vast set of privileges, whilst in Antwerp they had few such rights. But the economic reality was such that trading in Antwerp, even without special conditions, was a lot more lucrative than seeking clients in the declining town of Bruges. And as oversight from the contour was a lot laxer in Antwerp than in Bruges, the more entrepreneurial traders flaunted the rules openly, setting up trading businesses together with their Dutch colleagues. Sudermann believed that to rebuild the power of the Hanse in Flanders, they needed to move to Antwerp. And not only that, the Hansards had to be forced to live together in a contour, as they had done in Bergen and Novgorod, so that discipline could be restored. Because only with discipline could the Hansa force the powers in Antwerp to grant them new privileges, the same way as the leaders of Bruges had been forced to do so in the 14th century. So, Sudermann had an enormous trading contour built, near the harbour of Antwerp. The contour covered a 5,000 square metre plot. Its facade stretched for 80 metres. It allegedly had 365 windows. It had 23 storage rooms, 133 luxury bedrooms, 27 cellars plus communal dormitories, dining halls and several kitchens. The plan was that all Hansards active in Antwerp were to live here at the contour, tightly supervised by the aldermen. But take up was limited. Many of the Hansards who already lived in Antwerp had moved there permanently, had married and had bought property. When asked to move themselves and their families into the new building, they refused, preferring to be excluded from the Hansa privileges. Now, still, some Hansas did agree to move in, so Sudermann felt that things might eventually work out after all. But already by 1566, whilst the contour was under construction, the first signs of religious trouble appeared. A wave of iconoclasm overshadowed the grand opening as Antwerp shifted towards Calvinism, which brought about a sharp response from King Philip II of Spain, now overlord of the Low Countries. In 1576 the Spanish troops sacked the city. In 1584 the city was besieged again, and in 1585 the Schelde River was blocked by the Protestant Netherlands, which further reduced the amount of trade going through it. Because of the decline in commercial activity, the contour could not service the debt taken on while it was built. So in 1591, a special tax was levied on the cities to pay off the debt. But still, the contour gradually emptied out as Antwerp's fortunes dwindled. It was still owned by the Hanseatic cities of Lübeck, Hamburg and Bremen when Napoleon restructured the Antwerp harbour, which left the building surrounded by water on all sides became a warehouse and later barracks. In 1893 it burned down, and what remained was removed. In 2011, the brand new Museum am Strom opened on the site, displaying the art and culture of the port and city of Antwerp. For Sudermann, the failure of the contour in Antwerp was a major setback, and that was followed shortly after by the closure of the Stahlhof in London. The English had been enraged by the lack of reciprocity in the trading relations with the Hansards. The German merchants in London had been insisting on their privileges, many of which dated back as far as the 12th century, which gave them free access to the whole of the English market. Meanwhile, English traders travelling into the Baltic were hindered at every junction. 
As the Tudor monarchy consolidated power into a more modern state, these medieval oddities became harder and harder to take. So one of the few acts of the very short reign of Edward VI, the son of Henry VIII, was to recall the Hanse privileges. And a few months later, his sister and successor, Mary I, Bloody Mary, readmitted the Hansards, but only on paper. The merchants were still being harassed. The Hanse responded with a trade embargo, but could not make it stick, so the situation remained challenging for the remaining Hansards in England. When fellow Protestant Elizabeth I came in, the situation improved a bit, but then the contour's support for England's allies in the Netherlands was lukewarm, so then Elizabeth resumed her predecessor's positions. Meanwhile, the English merchants went into Germany. They started trading through the town of Emden, which wasn't a member of the Hanse. Hansards, who still wanted to sail to England, had to do something. So first Stade and then Hamburg signed an agreement with England, letting the merchant adventurers in. Now, Sudermann tried to keep the Hanse together and form a unified front against the English, but it didn't hold. He tried to force Hamburg to call off the deal with the English, but the organization was no longer able to enforce such kind of discipline internally. Nor could they stop Elbing and Danzig to open their doors to the merchant adventurers. Lübeck then obtained a decision by the imperial court that the English had established an illegal monopoly in the Baltic. Oh, the irony. The English took one look at that and the probability of Emperor Rudolf to leave his cabinet of curiosities in Prague to fight them on the beaches and laughed heartily. Going one further, as they pursued the Spanish back into Cadiz in the year after the Spanish Armada, they burned 60 German ships before Lisbon. Now the emperor orders the merchant adventurers to be expelled from Germany, sanctioning anyone who harbors them with the imperial ban. Elizabeth I reacts immediately. She throws the remaining German merchants out and seizes the Stahlhof. In 1598, the Hanse privileges in England end for good. The buildings of the Stahlhof are returned 20 years later, but the organization never recovers. As far as the great contours and trading privileges in the main international ports are concerned, the Hanse is finished. Their internal organization may be tighter and more efficient than in the past, but fewer and fewer cities are prepared to pay the levy to fund it. For what? There were few benefits when traveling abroad. And even when trading with other Hanse cities, they did no longer provide much preferential treatment to their fellow members. And as we go forward, the Hanse keeps shrinking until the very last Hanseatic died in 1669. This all sounds terribly depressing, doesn't it? Lost wars, closed contours, aggressive Dutch and English competitors, dwindling finances. All these Hanse merchants must have been walking around with their heads in their hands bemoaning their lost fortunes, right? Well, as it happened, they did not. Sure, the fall of the Hanseatic power in the Baltic is unlikely to have been something that cheered them up, but on the other hand, business was great. Not just great, but really really great. And one of the reasons for that was the same reason that led to the fall of the contour in Antwerp and the loss of the Stahlhof, the Eighty Years' War. The Eighty Years' War, I know the Hundred Years' War, I know the Thirty Years' War. What was the Eighty Years' War, you may ask? Well, that is if you are neither Dutch nor Belgian. In that latter case, you are very likely to know exactly what the Eighty Years' War was. The fun thing about the Eighty Years' War, nobody can agree when it actually started. One date could have been 1566, the Belden Storm, that iconoclastic uprising in Antwerp that interrupted the construction of Sudermann's Great Contour. It was definitely underway in 1572, when Dutch rebels against Spanish rule captured the undefended port of Den Briel in southern Holland. The Eighty Years' War, no, the Dutch Revolt as it's called, was that long and arduous struggle of the Low Countries against the government of the Habsburg Netherlands. Habsburg rule had become unpopular to both Protestants and Catholics, due to its push for centralization, the curtailing of the ancient privileges of the cities, and its demand for taxes, 
And on top of that, the local governors had become increasingly aggressive in trying to keep the Netherlands in the Catholic faith. Well, at the end of this war, at the end of the 80 years, the Low Countries were split up into the Spanish Netherlands, broadly speaking modern-day Belgium, and the Dutch Republic, which is modern-day Netherlands. The war breaks down into two phases. The first was from these unknown beginnings to a truce in 1609. That truce lasted 12 years. And then hostilities resumed and continued alongside or as part of the Thirty Years' War and ended in 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. The Eighty Years' War completely changed the structure of northern European trade. The rebellious Dutch provinces fought a war for survival on two fronts. One was the military struggle and the other the economic struggle. Militarily, the Spanish just kept besieging one city after another. If they succeeded, they sacked them, most famously Antwerp in 1574. If they did not succeed, they devastated the surrounding territories. But irrespective of whether success or failure, the cities quite quickly returned back into rebellion. The Dutch side was gaining the upper hand roughly 30 years in when Maurice of Orange reformed the army and created modern warfare. All that was great and heroic, but the foreign merchants who preferred not to be caught up in sieges or having their goods plundered by unpaid soldiers left Flanders. As the war continued, the Dutch cities need to rebuild by themselves, and so they try to hit the enemy where it hurt most, in its wallet. An important part of the wealth of Habsburg Spain came from the spice trade that the Portuguese had opened up when they sailed round the Cape of Good Hope. And that is where the Dutch now directed their ships. The Spice Islands of Indonesia. And these are the beginnings of the Dutch East India Company, the first joint stock company in the world and a source of enormous incomes, making it the other reason why these few provinces on the edge of the sea could fend off the greatest empire Europe had seen since the fall of Rome. For our Hanseatic cities, this reset of the political environment was a huge boon. Both the Dutch and the Spanish had a near inexhaustible demand for things like wood, ash, tear, flax, metals and saltpeter to build their ships and cannons and to make sails and gunpowder. All of this could be got from the Hanseatic cities, in particular from Danzig. As a neutral party, Danzig could supply both sides, and it was now part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which stretched all the way from the Baltic almost to the Black Sea, encompassing some of the most fertile lands in Europe. Which gets us to the other great business, food. As the climate was hurtling towards the true depths of the Little Ice Age, grain became a hugely important commodity. And again, Danzig was in a pole position to supply the world with the wheat, rye and barley of Ukraine and Poland that came down the Vistula River. And what made it even more lucrative was that the Dutch were restrained from taking the grain much beyond their homeland. Grain that used to travel from Spain, Portugal and the Mediterranean on Dutch ships was now transported on ships from Hamburg, Lübeck and Danzig because as neutrals they were allowed to enter these ports. The Spaniards even ordered their Italian allies not to accept grain from Dutch traders during a major famine, which created a situation where the Grand Duke of Tuscany and even the Pope had to send embassies to Protestant Hamburg and Danzig to purchase much-needed grain. Trade with the Mediterranean increased rapidly throughout the late 16th and early 17th century, mainly bringing down again grain, and but also metals and wood, and returning with wine, spices and luxury goods. The trade gained such an extent that Hamburg established an admiralty to protect their ships from North African pirates. They had to set up a special budget to buy the freedom of Hamburgers who had been enslaved on the Barbary coast. One such captured Hamburg captain converted and spent his life as a Muslim pirate called Murat. The good relations between Hamburg, Lübeck and Danzig with Spain and Portugal meant that they could sail even further, with several Hamburg merchants establishing trade with Brazil. The scale of this expansion of trade is truly impressive. In 1497, the earliest year we have a complete record, 795 ships passed through the Öresund. It stays around the 1000 number for the first half of the 16th century, and then it rises quickly. 
During the period 1557 to 1569, the average was 3,280. By the 1590s, it's an increase to 5,036 journeys. And by the end of the century, it peaked at 6,673 ships passing through. That's more than nine times the number of ships of a century earlier. Part of the increase in the number of journeys were advances in marine technology. The Dutch had invented a new type of ship, the flute, which could do two journeys from the Netherlands to the Baltic and back in one year. And then, these ships were much larger than they had been in the 15th century. So economically, the Hanse had grown at least factor 5 during this period of its political decline. What had also changed was the population of the Hanse cities. During the heyday of the Hanse in the 14th and 15th century, the cities were populated by merchants speaking Middle Low German. The cities were happy to take in people from other Hanseatic cities and give them citizens' rights, but they did not grant those rights to traders they regarded as foreigners. In particular, not the English, the Portuguese and the Italian. The Dutch were also seen as foreigners now, even though, at least in part, they used to live in the Holy Roman Empire, some of whom had actually been members of the Hanse in the past, and they spoke Middle Low German. By the middle and late 16th century, that picture had fundamentally changed. Portuguese and Italians who had fled the war in the Netherlands had found refuge initially in Cologne, but that lasted only a relatively brief period, so they moved north to Hamburg, which, despite being a Protestant city, was happy to accommodate them. The same was true for the Dutch, who not only travelled to Hamburg and Danzig on their swift freighters, they also settled in these places. And finally, there are the English. The merchant adventurers sponsored by the Tudor monarchs had been searching for a safe port on the German coast. Emden had been their first base, but when the ancient port of Stade on the Elbe River allowed them in, they took the opportunity to get closer to the main waterways and roads south. They stayed in Stade for 20 years, but after the defeat of the Armada, the city of Hamburg, who had so far been hesitant, opened its doors to the English, even if that meant heavy repercussions from Lübeck and the other Hansards. The English did not only bring the now dominant English cloth to Hamburg for further distribution, the friendship with England also meant that Hamburg merchants could ship their goods through the Channel, even goods going to Spain or the Mediterranean. Other Hansards had to take the northward route over the top of Britain and west of Ireland to escape the English privateers in the Channel. Going round Britain and Ireland is not fun as anyone who ever did the round Britain and Ireland race can attest. Foreign merchants in Hamburg were free to trade on exactly the same terms as the locals. They could form companies with other merchants, including Hansards. There were no guilds that restricted certain routes to its members, and they were largely free to practice their religion. Now, not everyone shared Hamburg and Danzig's attitude towards foreigners. The official Hansa policy, shaped by Lübeck, remained strongly protectionist, insisting that guests could only trade with approved local intermediaries, could not create companies with Hansards and had to leave after a prescribed period of time. Some cities tried to enforce these protectionist policies. Others, like Hamburg and Danzig, ignored them. As the Eighty Years' War comes to an end in 1648, the great economic boom that had lasted almost its entire length came to an end. Merchants from the United Provinces were now free to sail and trade with everyone again. And thanks to the success of the Dutch East India Company, they had become the dominant maritime power in Europe. And as that happened, the routes down towards Iberia and the Mediterranean were again serviced by the Dutch, making life harder for the Hansards. It was in particular Lübeck traders that found it hard to adjust to these changed conditions. They had kept up with Hamburg and Danzig during the Eighty Years' War, they had a more corporatist approach, so they founded a guild of traders going to Spain that excluded foreigners from taking part. This guild had prospered, but is now caught in a struggle for survival. Lübeck, always the largest city in the Hansen, now fell behind Hamburg and Danzig in terms of population. Hamburg, which had had about 15,000 inhabitants in 1500, grew to 50,000 by the beginning of the 17th century, making it Germany's largest city bigger than Cologne at 35,000 and Lübeck at 20,000-25,000. 20, 
its merchant fleet became larger than any other thanks to the addition of many Dutch shipping firms who had relocated to the Elbe. It built mighty warships to protect its convoys. Its foreign traders, in particular the Portuguese, had made Hamburg the center of trade in sugar and spices. The Italians and Portuguese established commercial banks clustered around the Lombardsbrücke. A bourse was opened in 1558. In 1619, the Hamburger Bank became its central bank, modeled on the Bank of Amsterdam that was founded ten years earlier. In 1609, the Council of Lübeck reproached Hamburg before the Hanseatic Diet that barely a hundredth of its trade is in the hands of its own citizens, but handled by the Dutch, the Southern Germans, the French, the Portuguese, the English and others. That was a fate the city fathers of Lübeck would not want their citizens to endure. In 1609, Lübeck reconfirmed its rights of the staple, requiring everyone trading through its harbour to offer their wares to Lübeck merchants and only to buy from Lübeck merchants. This ordinance remained in force for 150 years, at the end of which Lübeck had become nothing more than Hamburg's harbour on the Baltic, in the same way that 300 years earlier, Hamburg used to be Lübeck's harbour on the North Sea. Trade, as it happens, is one of the few things where 1 plus 1 is 3. To say it with good old Adam Smith. In general, if any branch of trade or any division of labour be advantageous to the public, the freer and more general the competition, it will always be the more so. Openness to competition and willingness to accommodate foreigners is why, since the middle of the 17th century, Hamburg is one of the richest cities in Europe. Today it has 1.8 million inhabitants, whilst Lübeck, which stuck to its protectionist approach until the very end, has 217,000, a mere tenth of its rival. Let me close with a quote I found in this book by J.K. Dunlop I mentioned at the beginning. Dunlop had found a letter by a certain Dr. Thomas Nugent, a fellow of the London Society of Antiquarians, who visited the city in 1766. Dr. Nugent joined the English merchant adventurers at their factory, as their counting house in the Groninger Straße was called. There he visited the factory's bowling green, which was, quote, situated near the new church of St. Michael's in very good air, with a convenient house surrounded by tall, handsome trees where they frequently meet for recreation and exercise. At the same place there is a regular weekly assembly at which the gentlemen and ladies of Hamburg intermix with those of the factory, amuse themselves with chit-chat, cults and dancing. End quote. Nothing illustrates better the Hamburg approach to foreigners coming there to trade than granting them an English bowling green next to the most significant new church in the city. The place where it used to be is still called Englische Planke, after the boards they had set up around the bowling green. Now next week, I guess we will conclude our narrative. We will follow through to the last Hanseatic Diet in 1669 and take a last look at what the Hanse left behind. The society had created its culture and architecture. I hope you will join us again. And as always, I want to thank my patrons who have signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or have made a one-time contribution on historyofthegerman slash support. Thank you so much. As for sources for today's episode, please check the show notes. <laughs>